passages, he mentioned how he mentioned how strong initiation of block level state agency uh, incepted FRA in implementation in the region. And while the initiative uh, by the block level state agency was, agencies was undertaken collaboratively with a uh, non-state actor with a local civil society organization that exhibit positive horizontal and vertical linkages at the grassroots level, ensuring, uh, ensuring adaptation and creation of new synergies to ensure indigenous people's tenure rights. However, due to bureaucratic and elite control in the community institutions, decision-making for indigenous people's tenure security rest with others other than the community. And meanwhile, at the district level, if you look at it, if, if you look in the figure here, uh, that, uh, actors are observed to perform the power of non-decision making and deliberate misinterpretation and confusion of rules and guidelines. Uh, for instance, community tenures were rejected based on the notion that first only individual land titles would be given in the region. And due to relatively poor access to accurate information, inferior economic resources and limited capacities of non-state actors, they were vulnerable to manipulative negotiation and faced considerable difficulties in even identifying and bargaining their interests. And at the state and central level, linkages were uh, dysfunctional for IP's tenure and security that's uh, severely stifle or narrow down the forest tenure reforms. And these were just uh, hierarchical in nature. And internationally speaking, agencies cooperated, but rather indirectly with local actors through uh, financial aid and donations for capacity building and community, community empowerment, but not directly for FR implementation. So while the cross-level linkages are functional at the block and lower level, at the higher level agencies lack coordination and are hierarchical as you can see. Um, and with skewed information and knowledge and ad hoc decision-making, cross-scale and cross-level linkages are deliberately weakened where higher authorities easily preclude security of tenure or rights despite positive linkages at the, at the grassroots level. So talking about the positive linkages at the grassroots level, here comes the framing power where uh, amidst the weak cross-scale and higher cross-scale linkages, it is imperative to explain how power as a device is used, not on, uh, is a, as device is used only to maintain uh, status quo. And the framing power comes to problematize that status quo. So in the study, the framing power reveals that indigenous people frame state authorities in action or dysfunctional character in close association and support from local civil society group. And the community use multiple devices of participation, involvement, social political intermediation to negotiate their interests and priorities. And with realization of epistemic and social power by the community, they use powerful framing force to unlock bundle of powers in order to receive bundle of rights in the forest resource system. And there is positive interlinkages between non-state actors at the local level that help build trust and shape assertiveness and confidence in indigenous people to pursue their interests. And besides, uh, IPs use coercive bottom-up uh, framing power towards oppressive state actors, primarily the forest department, to subvert aggressive state authority over forests. Their epistemic awareness regarding their social legal identity plays a very crucial role here in framing issues. Um, there are studies which highlight that knowledge of privileges and safeguards along with external support induce these oblique subtleties of identity devices in community action as a means of resistance to state governmentality. And while uh, oblique subtleties work out well to refrain state's aggressive control, it does little to forego Vanraji's struggle for tenure security and welfare. Um, the community problematized narrow implementation of FRA, which is limited to providing land title papers, land title papers. And however, the community demand more than just a piece of paper as land titles alone cannot guarantee all associated rights. Um, and regardless, but regardless of, uh, you know, positive bottom up linkages to influence forest tenure discourse at the local level, Dominant state control on decision making and weak formal linkages continue to subvert proper implementation of uh, forest tenure reforms. Now to conclude, um, the findings illustrate that there is continuous tussle between actors within state and non-state actors, 
across scale to prioritize or deprioritize indigenous people's resource rights uh, with asymmetric power and weak cross, cross scale linkages within state agencies and between higher level state actors and non state actors, IP's tenural security is suppressed. And while power is formally distributed at different levels of just jurisdiction, ultimate locus of decision making lies with higher level state actors with no substantial autonomy given to the indigenous people. And nonetheless, uh, there is a hint of uh, nonetheless, there is a hint of positive bottom up linkages that is framed by the community coercion, NGO negotiation, bargaining, social and political intermediation and epistemic power of social legal identity that constrain fear state authority in the region. However, this fails to properly activate the dysfunctional higher level actors for indigenous people's tenure and security. And under this complex arrangement and multi-scalar interaction, the study flag up for cooperative just conservation where convergence, collaboration and coordination between multiple actors across scale could be a considerable approach to climate action where efforts of local communities pursuing social justice in the forest can be supported by top level actors, including international organizations, academics and national agencies. And yes, we need to reiterate how important co cooperative just conservation is because indigenous sovereignty is the direct democratic and the just you know, climate action. Um, and I think with that, I will put myself on hold. I think I'm a little up with time. I look forward to subsequent discussions. Thank you so much. Deepika, thank you very much. It does sound like certainly an extremely complex situation. So um, thank you for giving us a little bit of insight into uh, this complexity. Our next presenter is supposed to be Kunal Shadeo from IIT Bombay. And I do not think that Kunal is here. So Shivangi, are you ready to present? Okay, wonderful. I can do that. Thank you so much, Shivangi. Um, so our next presenter is going to be Shivangi Parikh from Yale University. And Shivangi's paper is entitled Adivasi Arts and Planetary Futures, Adivasi Artistic Responses to Climate Change from South Asia. Thank you very much, Shivangi. The floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Just to check, are you able to see my screen all right? Yeah. Um, okay. Yes, I am. Great. I can hear you fine. Thank well. you. I want to begin by thanking the Center for South Asian Studies uh, for organizing this symposium on climate change in South Asia. Thank you to the audience for participating and to my fellow panelists for their very important work on climate justice. My work may not um, directly speak to the discussion on climate justice, but I'm trying to think what justice perhaps might sound like or look like not in the language of rights, but in terms of indigenous creative expressions. Um, and thinking about climate change in their language. I also want to say at the beginning that this is an early attempt at thinking about some of my ethnographic work and paying more attention to the stories I heard and recorded when I was doing my dissertation field work in Central India. Through the stories, artworks, and ethnographic vignettes from my research that I'm sharing with you today, I'm interested in think. I'm interested uh, in centering Adivasi life worlds and thinking about what it would mean to engage with the Anthropocene from the South, inspired by Adivasi modalities of prayer and coexistence. I use the term Adivasi to refer to Pardhan Goons of Central India. The term Adivasi can be translated as original inhabitants and is a form of political identification asserted by groups historically marginalized by colonial and post-colonial forms of governance and nation building in India. The term, however, doesn't neatly translate to indigenous and what it means in a settler non North American context. Owing to histories of migrations and continued mobilities across different parts of South Asia, it is often difficult for communities to make land-based claims of indigeneity. Most of them have migrated into the regions where they live. They have lived as 
non-isolated agrarian and mobile groups that occupied and continue to occupy heavily wooded and resource-rich regions, which contribute to their and continue to contribute to their displacements and marginalization. This is all to say that um, indigeneity and more importantly, the question of who is an indigenous dweller is a particularly complex debate in, in South Asia. In this talk, I'm focusing in specific on the Pardhan Gond Adivasis. Gonds are one of the largest tribal groups and their longer histories speak of them as powerful rulers in pre-colonial kingdom of Mandla in central India. The Pardhan Gonds worked as itinerant bards for their communities and as the genealogists of the Gond groups. As storytelling and non-sedentary groups, they were particularly vulnerable within the colonial regimes. Through gradual criminalization of their ways of lives, they were delegitimized and designated as socially undesirable and primitive. Since 1970s, however, Pradhan Gonds have been working with state institutions to make, to make the contemporary moment, a moment of growing circulation of Adivasi arts and material culture. On the screen, now I have a few examples of artworks made by Adivasi artists that I'm bringing into discussion here. With this talk, I want to think about in what ways does contemporary Adivasi stories and art be brought, be brought into, be thought of as environmental aesthetics that propose alternative imaginaries of human environment relations rooted in modalities of care and spiritual relations with the environment as visual histories and meditations on how relationships of interde interdependence with the natural world are produced, experienced, and creatively sustained in everyday lives, Adivasi arts, together with the works of indigenous artists across global contexts, respond to some of the most urgent needs in the face of climate crisis. In the first part of, of this talk, I'm trying to think with Pardhan Gond oral stories. I'll share two stories today. One is the story of the origin of the Narmada River, and the other is a story in the sense of an ethnographic vignette that captures the making of tigna, which are geometric patterns made with mud or soil on the floors and walls of homes. I'm trying to think about the two together, and I invite you to help me, to, to help me think through this relationship. In the second part of the talk, I'll draw, an attention, I'll draw your attention to an artwork made by a very popular and renowned Pardhan Gonda Adivasi artist from Central India, Durga Bai, and discuss what she has to say about what it means to live and dwell in an environment. The story of the furious divine river. It was a beautiful winter afternoon at Gorabai's home. A group of women, her sisters and nieces, leaned over canvas rolls spread out on the floor and painted minute repeating patterns with fluid but measured brush strokes. The warm, bright afternoon sun had filled up this small room on the third floor of their narrow house. Gora Bai was lounging in the most sunny spot in the room. Lao aj Narmada Maya ki kahani batai de thun. Come, I'll tell you the Mother Narmada story today, she said, reaching out towards the recorder in my hand. She was more than comfortable with my tiny recording device by now and spoke into it like she was speaking into a microphone on stage. She held it firmly in her hands, her posture straightened, and she would often close her eyes. Reva man and woman discovered the Narmada River in the jungle as a little girl. They adopted the girl as their own and began raising her. They had another daughter named Jahila, and the two girls grew up together in the forest. When Narmada was of marriageable age, Reva arranged for her wedding with Son Bahadur from Chhattisgarh. On her wedding day, Narmada and Jahila were together, putting turmeric all over Narmada's body for a wedding ritual. Soon they could hear the distant sound of music and dance from the forest. The wedding procession was close by. Jahila couldn't control her excitement and asked Narmada if she could dress up in some of her jewels and go see the groom and festivities, promising to be back in time for Narmada to be ready for her wedding. Wearing the, wedding, uh, wearing the wedding attire and looking like a bride herself, Jahila reached the wedding procession and was mistaken as the bride by Son Bahadur. They got married and did not go any further. Narmada's worries grew as she heard the wedding music that's played when the bride and groom take their vows. 
Curious and confused and without her bridal trousseau, she started walking towards the procession with her body covered in turmeric. As the music intensified, she began to run, the turmeric from her body sprinkling all along the way. When she finally reached the spot and saw that Jahila and Son Bahadur were now married, she couldn't control her fury. In her anger, she kicked Son Bahadur with a force that, that sent, sent him back to Chhattisgarh. She held Jahila by her hair and cursed her that as a river, she would always remain dry. The turmeric from her body covered the earth yellow. That's why the mud near Amarkantak, the site of this episode is still yellow. And Jahila is a small faint river as the story says that runs there. And Son Bahadur is another river in Chhattisgarh. Furious and distraught from her misery, the story goes on to narrate instances of how the deities and others tried to stop Narmada as she began to flow towards the ocean and destroying whatever came in her way. And each of the sites of these confrontations are now sacred sites in the region. While transcribing and translating this story, I noticed that Gorabai's narration was split into two parts. In the beginning, she spoke slowly in a mix of Gondi and Hindi, as she always did it with me to make it more, more comprehensible. However, at the point in the story, where the Narmada River gets furious, there was a sharp and clear transition in her narration. As the river got angry, Gorabai let go of caution in her choice of, her, of words and spoke in her Gondi dialect. I read this sharp transition as a deep connection that she felt with the events of the story. The story gave her a vivid and almost visceral experience of the emotional turmoil in the river's life. In the story, the river flows through central India in fury and misery. The intensity of her suffering and wrath uh, brought the divine closer by making her more relatable, susceptible to misfortune, injustice, and in having a desire for destructive vengeance. But on a panel about climate justice, what does it mean to work with stories? What good are stories? With increasing conversations on climate change, as the rush to address and analyze extractive regimes around us intensifies, the reference to communities is in inserted merely next to terms like displacement, climate change, and resistance. But their accounts, which are embedded in community practices of storytelling, are often ignored. Working with stories means focusing not only on destruction, but also how the living beings and related landscapes are able to retain life. Dwelling on stories allows us to understand how the value of life is interdependent and reciprocal. To work with stories then is to think about the potential to retain, nourish and nurture life and all that is life giving. The story about the Narmada river that I narrated offers this understanding. Stories in that sense are life giving. They enliven in the landscape and give it life to imaginations. In the next section, I pay attention to the geometric wall art patterns called Digna made by Gond women. These are decorative patterns which are traditionally made of mud of different colors collected over the year from the forest and the banks of the river Narmada spread across a vast geography. The bright red tent was up and the frilly edges were fluttering. The chairs had been laid out, laid out and a crowd had gathered outside Bhagat's house in anticipation. The tourists arrived in their three big cars that had visibly driven through hilly trails and dusty fields to reach Bhagat's house. Bhagat gave a small speech and announced that they were going to begin the evening's program with a demonstration of how Digna is made. Gindabai had prepared for this and kept wet mud ready for the demonstration. She went to the kitchen and brought out her pot of muddy water. Squatting on the floor with a rag dipped in colored muddy, wa muddy water, she held between her thumb and two fingers a rag and she painted a large square on the courtyard floor. Within this square, she made two mirroring patterns and painted them in black, in brick red and ochre yellow. Someone brought her another pot from the kitchen. With a rag dipped in this pot of liquid black soil, she began filling the empty geometric space with black. This was Digna, painted in mirroring patterns of red, yellow, white and black. Digna are often geometric decorative patterns made by coating wet mud on the walls and now often also colors 
uh, acrylic and uh, other kinds of popularly available colors and pigments along the doorway and in different parts of the house. Part of the women's work in the home it is a way to decorate, but it is also a form of cleaning by painting the walls afresh. Digna could be a ceremonious or an everyday pack practice, but is especially done to register and acknowledge seasons, festivities, and rituals. Gendabai drew my attention to the materials with which Digna is traditionally made. She explained to me how she had collected three different kinds of mud from the river in from the river bank in preparation for this. Digna comes from the Narmada, Maya, she said. The different colors are the different kinds of mud found in this region. Yellow color comes from Ramraj mud, a kind of ochre mud found near Amarkantak. White color from the Chuhi or lime, and black and red are the other two kinds of soil commonly found in this region. In her words that imbue joy and reverence for the river and Digna, I saw a deep and intimate relationship with the river and the patterns that were now more distinct as the colors deepened as the mud dried on the floor. As I dwelled more on what Gendabai had said to me and the story of the river that Gorabai had narrated, I saw the meanings and relationships between the story and Digna. Uh, from the colors of the mud that differentiate parts of Digna to the emotions that the patterns and its making inspired in the maker, Digna has a deep connection with the Narmada River and its story. Gorabai's story of Narmada Maya is also the story of the colors of Digna. It is in the color of the mud that the presence of the river deity is marked. It is common knowledge that the yellow mud acquired its color through the event in the life of Narmada. The color marks an event in the past and also a sacred presence. The repeated iterations of making digna throughout the year also means that working with the soil, the mud, finding fresh mud by the river, bringing it home and painting on the walls with it is a continuous relationship with the, between the river and the home. It makes the river and the mud integral to the seasonal ritual cycles of lives lived in proximity to a river. Hence, the relationship is spiritual, but also productive and utilitarian, realized and sustained through working with material forms. Paying attention to Digna highlights how long-term sustainable relations with natural environments demand repeated work. It is in the repeated telling of stories or the seasonal iterations and patterns of Digna that one can see the work and effort of producing enduring relationships, enduring sustainable relationships with one's environment. How to live sustainably and respectfully in a natural environment, how to build lives of creative coexistence in the natural world. Digna and these stories help us think about these questions. And I'll move to the final section, which is about dwelling in an environment. What does it mean to dwell in an Adivasi worldview? In Digna and the oral stories, there's a form of relatedness between humans and their environment. It is a form of living and a perspective that is able to build relations to mythical beings, spirits, landscapes, but also the physical structure of the house, mud, and water. Care for the house, stories about specific bends in the river's flow, the color of the soil, are all ways in which humans establish an imaginative relationship with the more than human world around them. In imagining the features of the landscape as divine, sacred, and infused with life, the difference is reaffirmed. Yet, there is a way in which relationships are established with different events, entities in this environment through stories and repeated labor, through a repeated performing and doing. It is this persistent doing and redoing that digna or stories demand. The impermanence of these acts and practices necessitates the work of remembering, repeated performing and sustaining a relationship. Dwelling is processual, always ongoing. Interaction with nature and the use of natural materials or resources in a specific rhythmic and constrained manner is integral to building lives in particular environments. To further explain the specific ethic of inhabiting natural landscapes, I draw into discussion now an artwork by Durga Bai Vyam that participates in, a, in the discussion as her own depiction of what it means to dwell in an environment. 
This untitled artwork by Durga Bai Vyam is situated in and emerges from a way of life that builds a home, not just in the physical structure of the house, but also in the larger world outside of the physical home. Depicted here as a tree that comes into being, uh, I'm conscious of time just wrap, wrapping up, um, with the work of living and sustaining life. It is simultaneously built and provides a way to build lives. It is this understanding that the various activities that constitute work, travel, routine, upkeep, etc., are what make a dwelling a home. Uh, just to quickly reference Tim Ingold, whose dwelling perspective, where he argues that living and being in an environment is not the revelation of pre-existing forms, but the very process wherein form is generated and held in place. Like the tree in the artwork, with its roots or growth situated in a built home, the dwelling perspective of being in an environment is one where the specific form, shape, and nature of the world emerges and as one engages in the activities of life, as opposed to the self-contained individuals confronting a world out there. Hence, the life world as a growing tree is one that grows rooted in a built structure and is also simultaneously coming into being as it is inhabited. Uh, through this paper, I've, I think, proposed a few questions and some reflections. First, how can we think about indigenous stories and storytelling about the environment as a form of knowledge production? What are the implications and importance of thinking about this question of how to live with the divine environment and thinking of it as integral to Adivasi imaginaries and perceptions of the environment? With that, what is it that emerges as specific to Adivasi imaginaries of what it means to dwell in an environment and what can it offer to us in reconfiguring human environment relations as creative responses to climate change? Thank you. Thank you so much, Shivangi. That was really fascinating. And I don't believe that um, Kunal has joined us. Can anyone confirm for me that that's the case? I don't see him. Yeah, okay. Well, he must have had something come up. So we're sorry to miss Kunal's presentation, but we do now have more time for a discussion among the presenters who are here. So we haven't got any open questions left in the question box. All those of you who are attending, please do um, put your questions in the question box. I would like to ask you to please keep your questions um, related to the topic at hand, if you could. And I would love to hear from you. So while attendees are thinking of questions, do any panelists have questions for each other? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah great presentations like i've learned a lot and you know got to know a lot about it so i have questions both for ajmal and shivangi um for ajmal um i think you mentioned about how floods has been a historic you know has historically been there and how people presume it differently these days and how it was before i was just wondering um whether uh because i uh, uh because I have uh, relations, I have relatives back in Kerala, and I think one of uh, one of them mentioned that these days people are just not having ponds in their home because I think every house has a has their own pond where they you know during the monsoons the water get you know um, uh, uh, gets uh, saved in the water pond. So nowadays with building of new infrastructure and houses, people are kind of avoiding to have a pond in their backyard or something of sort. So do you think on the cast lines and uh, how the flooding and, you know, uh, development or infrastructure has like the interlinkages of it? So yeah, if you can talk about that. Uh, and also for Shivangi, I think, um, I see this may be beyond the scope of your study, Shivangi, but I was just wondering whether the women paint about the injustices that have been dwelled upon them, like in these paintings and in this craft that they are in. So what do you think about it? Just out of curiosity, I know it may be out of the scope of your study, but yeah, just out of curiosity. Thank you.
should i start responding okay yeah so i mean any conversation about climate change and climate justice should not be done with the trajectory of development that we have had and how environment like particularly was was treated in that sense um, both uh, like of course prior the independence the kind of exploitation that happened and in the in the like in the, uh, in the post in the post colonial like development and and, and also the kind of rearrangement that happened um, in the post liberalization in that sense so like all those forces have 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 made a role in the sense that how the ecology has uh, changed in that like over the years historically so like of course like kerala has also like gone through that of course now thinking about uh kerala is also like one of the 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 most uh, like fragile ecologies in that sense so like of course you know but 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 what happens is that you have a, a very different kind of rain that takes place now you you have like for example the amount of water that come out of a rain for a month happens in few hours actually so uh, that is uh, you know like the attribution signs have kind of like indicated like most of these that how uh, there is change in that and also you have a, a historical process of uh, changes like in that sense of like, like like you know like of course about ponds and then small canals in that sense have and like rivers again so you have that whole lot of ecological changes uh, 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 also happening in the background i can go next ajmal if you are okay. yeah, yeah i'm i'm, I'm, I'm thank you uh thanks dipika for thanks for that question um i'm trying to think of like what i would qualify as depictions of of injustice in in artworks um first of all there are very few women artists who sort of produce and paint as a sort of a sole owners of their their creative work durga bai is, is an exception and there is a few others most women still continue to work as um, as sort of like training and and contributing to to artworks by other more dominant and more popular artists um so that's a form of uh, uh, injustice within the creative production that that the women are are a part of but in terms of um, depictions of climate injustice i would say that yes there are artists who are sort of uh, beginning to think about as they have themselves also moved to cities and they live in different environments from what they have they've known in their lives before there are ways in which they are they're able to reflect on on what it means to dwell in in an environment like a city and and what forms of uh, reflections on climate justice that, that does that evoke for them so there's a there's a way in which uh, articulations of land based rights and uh, uh, sort of uh, ownership of space and uh, political rights is also coming into into these artworks but um, it remains very sort of uh, on the fringes i wouldn't say it's sort of like a very dominant strain within within the artworks but i think it's emerging and uh, i would just be i mean curious to see how that shapes up but thank you for that question yeah. that's interesting to know as well thank you yeah, thank you for that question deepika and thank you shivangi for that answer and i want to um ask a question that builds a little bit on what shivangi is talking about um what i found so interesting is that um we think of climate justice as a framework that involves the social and inequities that are social in nature when we are trying to address what is happening with um, climate change. So I think that um, we hear a lot about rights and rights-based frameworks and um, engaging with the existing laws that states have and trying to change them, trying to um, engage with the people who make them at multiple levels as Deepika has shown um, 
in the in all the complexity that they exist in. But Shivangi is articulating different epistemologies of justice. And I mean, I don't know if it's Shivangi who is articulating this or it's the, the Gondi artists themselves. And I was very struck by the paintings. I'm a little bit familiar with Gondi artwork from the book Vimayana, which is one that um, definitely addresses uh, injustice head on through Gondi artwork. So um, I think that's one example of um, Gondi artwork being used to address injustice, although it's not necessarily related to climate in that particular instance. Um, but it is Adibasi and Dalit lives specifically. So um, for Ajmal and for Deepika, in your research, what other epistemologies do you think that the people you're working with in your fieldwork approach justice from? What else shows up? if that has been part of what you've encountered. I'm just curious. Um, I've been thinking about it. Uh, so, uh, uh, like the kind of uh, how they approach injustices, uh, like there is one, uh, it was funny for me, like in the first instance, when I got to, when I when I was interviewing one of the forest guards who was, uh, uh, I don't know, he was he really you know scared of the community of some or something of sort, but uh, he kind of mentioned that uh, the community are very violent. Like if I stop them from accessing forest, they will not say anything to me at that point. But in the night, they will come to their check post and throw you know, stone pell uh, his uh, check post and he's living alone in the forest and without any help and support. And he was kind of um, <laughs> uh, scared when he told me that, uh, that I just want, he, he just told me that I just want to get transferred. It's such a, it's such a disturbing state to be in. And I was just wondering whether a very small community, so the community that I'm working with, they are just very few in number, like, total population of them is just thousand and they are scattered all over the place they're not accumulated in one place they're scattered in different parts of uh, you know Uttarakhand and at the border states so I was just wondering how is that you know how's that happening and whether is it just a narrative that they that that person would be having but I was talking also with one of the Pradhans uh, in Pradhans is the village head of, uh, of any village so he was also mentioning that uh, he, he said this literally, uh, these people get uh, ev all the things that they want from the government because of the social category that they are in. And I was, and he, he belonged to an upper caste, um, well-to-do family, he was a Pradhan and had all access to, you know, uh, his house is at the city, not in the village and he had, he was pretty well off in comparison to the people, to the, you know, the, to the tribal community, if you look at their houses and how they are living. So I think these narratives are kind of, uh, comp like, it's very complex to understand actually what's happening on ground, because when you look, when you talk to the community, they actually are suffering from, uh, you know, a lot of injustices. And because of not having land rights and forest rights, they are always in fear, what if they get caught? Like I was talking to one of the um, women there who were, who was, who were collecting uh, fuel wood or like fodder. They were saying, yeah, we, we need to go at a particular time slot so that the forest guard who doesn't go, because there is a time slot for the forest guard to go to the forest and, you know, check things around. So they kind of manage those, you know, uh, things in fear of the authority, in fear of the state. So there, there are these multiple aspects to this. So yeah, it's it's pretty complex and I'm still trying to figure out what's actually, you know, is there as I am doing, as I still undergo my studies. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Deepika. Asma, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Yeah, so, I mean, um, uh, in my work, what I kind of like encounter is that you have like, of course, uh, a good body of work that comes from the indigenous theoreticians actually 
like mostly like based in the north america as well as part of like europe in that sense which i like of course find very useful but then uh, we have complexities about indigenous and the adivasi like first of all now secondly uh, what my work try to foreground is basically to think about caste in that sense uh, because like something very peculiar to like our part of the world uh, where i'm like for example as we speak this 11 people have like like died uh, day before yesterday in the state of like maharashtra due to heat waves uh, yeah, and most part of asia actually have crossed like 45 to 46 like degrees in that sense so now who are these people who are outside uh, who ha have to work as agricultural laborers as 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 construction laborers and you know uh, so uh, that's the kind of uh, 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 push that I, like I am trying to bring in with what I'm like trying to do and think about you know uh, how and why uh, 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 caste would play like a, like an important role in both in terms of like understanding climate change impacts of that both historically and the contemporary in that sense and how do we think about then climate justice in places like India. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Do any of you have questions for each other? Not really, but yeah, I'd like to add one more point that colonialism, how, you know, we need to decolonize uh, climate action is also something which is very much talked about these days when we talk about climate justice and how you know indigenous cosmologies are also in place while we are having these scientific western uh, understanding of nature of conservation so these are also important topics to you know dwell in when we are talking about uh, climate justice, Adivasis, and Dalits. So yeah. Yes, absolutely. And the work that you're doing, Deepika, reminds me of a lot of approaches to um, just how militarized the national parks are in many parts of South Asia, um, India, Pakistan, Nepal perhaps also in Bangladesh, I'm not quite so sure about that, but having, yeah, having driven through these highly militarized national parks, it's quite striking mm -hmm. just how uh, the extent to which they've gone to um, separate what is supposed to be like the quote unquote wilderness from where people live. And this is something that completely is colonial and goes completely against the indigenous epistemologies, which um, Shivangi was showing through her references to the Gondi art. And um, yeah. it's just quite striking the complexity of like, we see very much that there are these two epistemologies that are in conflict and then um, the layers that the layers of social interaction that keep things the way they are and kind of prevent things from changing rapidly are very striking and Deepika I think that's one of the things that your work is elucidating yeah and yeah, all of absolutely. your work in uh, yeah. very different ways so thank you all very much Thank you. If I can just add quickly, I, I would like to really um, express my sort of admiration for the work that both of you, Ajmal and Deepika, you're doing, because I think Anna's question about sort of paying more concerted attention to and unearthing sort of these or, or centering the indigenous epistemologies is an important one, but I also recognize the difficulty of doing that work in the, like Anna was also saying, in the heavily militarized and the kind of power asymmetries that a complex sort of caste context brings to, to some of these indigenous contexts. And I think in my, I was able to do this work, like I was trying to make, make very clear through some of the ethnographic vignettes was only in, in contexts where there was an, a performance of a certain indigenous identity or an Adivasi identity by these people and these groups. And uh, 
it's it's not as if people were comfortable or in the in the performance or the making of artworks so these are some of the ways in which i i try to grapple with this question of how to really come at or think about in the, uh, adivasi epistemologies and it's a, it remains a very complex and contested question but thank you thanks everyone Okay, we do have one question in the box from Jivan Mani Paudel, which is, thanks for the wonderful presentations. All three presenters have used different perspectives to explain climate justice. Maybe you all can um, see if you're talking about explaining, but um, do you think we need alternative or non-Western epistemology to understand climate, just, climate change in the case of South Asia? So is it for all of you? Um, whoever wants to go first can go first. I can go first. I yeah. Okay. Thank thank you so much for the question. I think yeah, this is a very important question that uh, you know you have asked. So in my study as well, I am not just taking polycentric governance as it is. It is a Western uh, you know Western epistemology, but I am testing it as well whether it works and so in global south or whether uh, you know how how collective action can be or cannot be. Uh, shaped by polycentric governance or whether there are polycentricity in governance, are there, you know, uh, are there actors or agencies which are actually autonomous? Because one of the tenets of polycentric governance talks about having certain degree of autonomy. While when you look at the pragmatic power and sorts of power, there are very less substantial power that has been given to the communities and there are they are very much vested in the state and not other actors not even ngos or even judiciary for that matter right so yeah alternatives to that could to be honest at the moment that is one of the things which also i feel that we need to you know tackle with because these understanding western understanding and being generalized to like most of the uh common resources is something which needs to be considered and should have more empirical evidence whether this is this concept is uh, you know applied to all these uh, geographies so yeah thank you i can go next just to briefly respond to jibin's uh, uh, question i i think i agree and i will just sort of build on what deepika has said um, there is definitely a need to even sort of rethink the, the concept of climate change and, and if there is a, um, a comparable sort of con con concept that is available to us within the, epi the epistemologies that we work with. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to think about it through my work and uh, thinking even if coexistence or just these ideas of living with could be um, something that could help us Sort of contribute to those discussions. Um, I don't have a ready concept yet, and I don't think it is sort of uh, going to be available to us even in the language of climate change because that that language also doesn't even exist in in these contexts in which we work. So, emic understandings of uh, climate change is something that I would think that's where the work needs to happen. What are sort of like the kinds of understandings or or ways of living that can speak to how we are conceptualizing climate change, because climate change itself, even in the Western context, remains very much an ongoing and in-process construction. It's, it's, I don't think we have arrived at a very fixed understanding of what it is. So I think that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you, Sivangi. Yeah, I, I mean, of course, uh, like both, like, like both of them have, have like flagged enough i think that you know like like maybe uh what i could like just add to both of them would be this that you know um i mean uh when we think about alternative epistemologies from like particularly places like south asia how do we think about uh uh, uh maybe integrating uh local epistemologies as well in that sense like of course like in terms of thinking about indigenous communities there is enough uh enough uh work that have kind of come out to kind of challenge 
you know, these like techno scientific notions of climate change again, and and also the actions on on climate change and climate justice even. Uh, so, like one of the ways in which how I think about this is that like you know, um, what could like for example, what would decolonization look like in countries like South Asia, or what could be different even in decolonizing in places like South Asia like specifically thinking about both the, the question of caste as well as the question of Adivasis. Thank you everyone for all of those responses. Yeah, we have a lot of things to think about and a lot of things to listen to and learn from. So I thank you once again, Jivan, for this question. Um, we have another question in the box from Alma Hartman which is, are there any efforts being done locally in the regions that you study that help build understanding and advocacy in urban areas, bridging the gaps or bridging the gaps between rural and urban experiences? Again, any of you can take this one. I, I didn't actually understand the question. Is it like, what are the climate justice efforts that are being done? in the region that we study or how can that be replicated in the urban areas? Is it something that uh, Alma is talking about? Can you please clarify it? Alma, do you wanna clarify by writing a clarification? I guess how I understood it is, um, hmm. is anyone working on helping people in urban areas understand um, situations in rural areas? Um, so Alma, if you could tell me if I'm, in the on the right track there that would also be helpful <laughs> yes i'm on the right track okay so i guess um as this may mm. not have been the focus of any of your research maybe you can speak to anything that you've witnessed that seems to be um addressing mm. things that um maybe trying to connect people's experiences in rural and urban areas. I can go first and, and this is a very, going to be a very incoherent and sort of uh, just thinking as I speak um, response to this. Um, I work mostly, part of my research was in a rural context, but a lot of it was based in an urban context with artists who have moved to cities and were working there now and have been living there and um, for quite some time. Um, so in my in my research, actually, it's the other way around where some of these artists from the who have been living in the city have gone back to their villages and now they're trying to mobilize people to get involved in in creative production. So I don't know if that would qualify as a bridge, a bridging of the urban and the rural context. Um, but that's sort of like a back and forth that I have I've noticed. And um, I, I, I hope that sort of answers Alma's question in some way. I can add one thing from my own experience that um, the Rural and urban may be talked about as two separate places, but in my own research, I talk about how they're very much um, not an unbridgeable mm -hmm. gap. And um, even things like urban, ur rural to urban migration um, tend to ignore the fact that circulation is more the way we can describe how people live their lives going back and forth quite frequently and having lives that exist in um, rural and urban areas. So I think there's a lot of, yeah, I don't know if a bridge is the right metaphor, although I know that this is just part of the way the question was asked. <laughs> no criticism is meant there whatsoever. But yeah, there's just so much circulation among rural and urban areas and the roads in between and the peri-urban areas also um, have a part to play in um, how people live their lives and how people experience these um, aspects of inequity related to climate and other things. So yeah, I don't mean to abuse my moderator privilege and go on and on. So um, if any of you want to respond to that, we can do that very shortly. We are at the time for the 10 minute break between panels. Yeah, I mean, like again, thinking 
ecologically rural produces the urban and urban like 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 exploits or or like the other way around again like so these these categories are you know i mean i would i would i would find those categories are not so helpful for me to think about actually the distinctions or the binaries of rural and urban like for example the 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 fishing fish communities of like sundarban who are adivasis have to go to calcutta or bangalore in that sense to make or to become the the footloose labor there in that sense so it, these questions are you know like like i mean yeah and also the uh, urban rural distinctions or those categories also emerged in the social sciences like literature in a particular context so i think it's also like useful to understand that as well i i kind of feel that yeah okay so yeah it took me a while to understand the question and you know i was just thinking over what what it could what how what you know what i could you know put in in this one so i think yes i think the experience is in urban and uh, rural areas especially in context to climate is very much you know could be similar just imagine like not imagine i think it's happening in for real in india the heat wave is all over india urban places are facing that rural areas are having that so these uh, experiences i think um where people are experiencing uh climate you know very extreme climate events is something which is kind of not the bridging the gap but it's kind of similar in their experiences and they see how it can it is unjust for, not just for them because they in because urban areas is has been considered to you know improve the standard of living ways of life but at the end of it the climate crisis is actually worsening how people experience advanced or modern ways of living right so i think in that way i think uh, these are some of the uh, aspects that uh, climate crisis and you know urban rural areas are experiencing i think yeah thank you so much deepika i would do want to close this session and we're going to take a break and start the next one at 4 in closing thank you very very much to all of you for these brilliant presentations and this wonderful discussion that we've had and i also want to encourage everybody who has been listening to this discussion and these panelists to um once we get the recording up check out the words of our keynote yesterday um kazi ashraf from the bengal institute because i think that you might find some of the things that he said pertinent to what we were discussing uh, just now so all right i'm going to stop the recording we can all take a break and we can reconvene at 4 Okay thank you so much thank you thank Anna you. for having us thank you Shivang Diana Ajmal for great presentations thank you thank you thanks Anna thanks. thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you.